Go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back to MLSS. We have uh, GYT again with us, who will continue continue meta learning session. So I would just uh, give the stage to GYT then. Thank you. Um, so uh, yesterday I was talking about, I kind of introduced to meta learning and um, optimization based and uh, black box approaches to uh, meta learning. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it might be good for me to kind of go back a bit and then just to re uh, recap for you what's meta learning. So the idea is that we have multiple tasks uh, coming from the same domain. And the assumption is that the tasks coming from the same domain has similarities that, uh, that can be shared. So we like to share information and learning across the tasks. And one of the key tenets of meta learning is we want to train our system such that within each task, given a training set, we can generalize to the test set as well as possible. And the approach of, meta, of various meta learning systems goes as follows. So for each task, we have a training set. And we assume that we have a base learner, which would take the training set and produce some parameter or predictor, which we can then evaluate on the test set corresponding to that task, okay? And that might produce some loss. And we're gonna assume that there's some parameter eta that's shared across all the tasks that um, somehow captures basically uh, what's similar across these tasks, okay? And the idea of meta learning is that we would like to minimize the test loss for each of these tasks uh, and the way we do this is we, if the whole process is differentiable, then we could optimize our, our shared parameters eta um, so that we can minimize the test loss correspond, corresponding to these tasks. Okay. Um, actually, why is that? Right, right. okay. So, and we can do this if everything's differentiable by backpropagating from the test loss uh, to the shared parameters. So we can optimize the shared parameters, parameters to minimize the test loss. And then once we have trained our system, we can then evaluate how well does it do on new tasks. So here's a new task, task four. Again, we might uh, given a training set, uh, apply the same base learner to this training set to get a predictor. And then we can then evaluate it on the test data and that produces um, some, uh, some performance. And you can think of this as how well does the meta learning system generalize to this new task in the sense that it can produce good uh, generalization on the test data given the training data. Okay. So that's a, um, a recap of meta learning. And um, there are various ways of formulating a meta-learning system. We talked about optimization-based meta-learning, where basically the base learner that we have here uh, actually have an optimization algorithm that like say empirical risk minimization. And the other approach is black box uh, meta-learning where we can just think about the base learner as basically some function which maps from our training data uh, to some test prediction. Okay. Um, right. So, um, yeah. Okay. Right. So, and basically, the uh, the structure for the base learner for lots of meta learning systems has this sort of form where given training data, which is we assume is ID drawn from some data generating distribution. Uh, we have some function, which is a learner function, which produces some representation for the task. So this is kind of like what the base learner thinks the task is about given the training data that, that is given. And then this task representation, along with some test input is fed into some predictor, which then uh, basically allows the base learner to make a prediction on, on the test data. Okay. Right. Um, 
And yesterday we ended up, we stopped around here and I was talking about uh, permutation invariance, right? So the idea is that our training data, if we assume that it's IID, then uh, we sh should prefer our base learner to have this invariance property where basically if you, if you take this uh, sequence of input-output pairs for the, our training data and we permuted this sequence, so pi here is a permutation on the indices of one to n, so this is a permutation of this sequence, then the output of the learner should be invariant to this permutation of this training uh, data set. Okay. And we can see that there's some methods which are permutation invariant, so things like MAML and prototypical networks and a uh, simpler version of matching nets as well, while, while some other methods like LSTM, MetaLearner, and MAN and SNAIL are not permutation invariant. Okay. Um, so today I'll be uh, talking about um, I guess uh, neural processes and conditional uh, neural processes, which are um, uh, a, I guess you could think of it as a black box meta learning um, system um, approach, which is permutation invariant. Um, and also, it also has a kind of a probabilistic interpretation as well. So, in a sense, it's like it takes on a probabilistic perspective on meta learning. Okay, so what is the conditional neural process? Um, uh, you can think of it as a black box meta learning system where given uh, training sets, so these are input output pairs. Okay, the way uh, the conditional neural process works is that we're going to take each of these input output pairs, we're going to embed them into some embedding space. So this is similar to uh, matching nets, except that we're actually embedding the input output pair as opposed to embedding only the input points. Okay. Um, so this function f uh, computes an output which is uh, given by r, which you can think of this as a as a representation of each r is a representation of the corresponding training input output pair. And then we're going to take each of these r vectors and we're simply going to average them or sum them. Okay. Uh, so this A here is an aggregation um, operation. Uh, so you could, uh, so theta here, which is going to be our representation of our task, is simply going to be an average of the corresponding R vectors, okay? So over the training sets. Okay. And we're going to take theta as a representation of the task. And what we're going to do in terms of making a prediction is we have another network, another part of the network, which then takes as input, uh, test input, and the representation of the task, and it produces a prediction for what the output should be. Okay. So you can see that if your aggregation operation is something like an average like this or a sum, because it is uh, this aggregation operation is permutation invariant, you can see that the whole thing is invariant to the ordering of the, of the training data. Okay. Um, right. So, so that's another example of one of this, uh, I guess, black box meta learning procedures, uh, systems uh, with a, a permutation invariance based learner. Okay. But uh, so, so that's kind of a, by way of introduction of what a conditional neural process is. But uh, we kind of call this thing a neural process because uh, in reference to, to actually a stochastic process, okay. Um, and so that kind of makes the link between meta-learning and uh, Bayesian non-parametrics. Um, so I'm not sure whether everybody here is uh, familiar with um, uh, stochastic processes. So I'd just like to kind of describe a bit um, what they are, okay. So this section of the tutorial is gonna be talking about a uh, probabilistic perspective on, on meta-learning. So we're gonna first describe what are stochastic processes and Bayesian non parametrics, and then I'll kind of come back to this notion of a neural process, and then I'll end with some uh, discussion of kind of uncertainty in meta learning. Okay. Um, right. So 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 just coming back to uh, this base learner architecture, we have training sets, 
produces a task representation, and then we have a prediction, uh, which then allows us to make a prediction based on the test input and the task representation. So then it produce, makes a prediction on the output. Okay. Um, so if you um, have a kind of a, like myself, a kind of uh, a probabilistic uh, perspective on things. So you could think about the following. So our data for each task is going to come from the task, right? And you can think about the task as uh, represented by some, some description of the task that uh, um, is unobserved, but generates both the training set and the test set in some IID fashion. Okay. And the question is, you know, for in the case of uh, supervised learning, which is what we have here, um, what is F? And uh, in the case of supervised learning, um, the unknown quantity that we would like to learn is, of course, a function which takes inputs x and produces outputs y, predictions on outputs y. Okay? So that f here actually is a function. It's an unknown function in a sense. Okay? And from that perspective, you could think, well, if that's the problem, then what is actually the optimal thing that you could do? Okay? So, and you can kind of uh, show that if we knew what that, uh, um, if we knew the structure of the whole problem, so if we knew what uh, f is, and if we knew what the uh, prior distribution on, on f is, okay, then the best that we could do in terms of making this prediction of y uh, given a test input x, n plus j and a training set. So the, the best that you could do is the following, is to basically make a prediction, which is simply the posterior predictive distribution um, um, given uh, the test input x, n plus j. Okay? And it's a posterior predictive in the sense that it's an expectation over uh, this unknown f. Okay. And it's an expectation over the posterior distribution over F given our training sets. Okay. So the idea is that we are treating the whole thing here as a generative model where we have an unknown F, we observe the training data, and then we're going to make a test prediction. And the best that we could do is given the observed training data, we first compute the posterior distribution over F. And then given an individual F, we can then form a prediction of y given a test input x. Okay. And the best that we could do is basically an expectation over this predictive distributions over the posterior over f. Um, right. And, and if that's the best that you could do, then one, then kind of in a sense, the best that we could do in terms of a representation of a task is actually simply the posterior distribution over f given our training sets, x, i, and y, i, i range from one to n, okay? So, so in a sense that theta star here, which is the posterior of f given the training sets is the best task representation that we could do, okay? Um, and so this is quite a useful way, I think, to think about what meta learning, what the computational problem of meta learning is. So this is in reference to uh, I think Peter Dan talked about Mars tree level of, uh, of, of analysis. You have the computational level and the algorithmic level and the implementation level. So this is kind of referring back to that computational level. What is the problem of meta learning? Um, and this way of thinking about this kind of tells you that, uh, you know, if you have all the information that you have in the world, then this is the best that you could do. And this is the computational task that's trying to uh, that's, that a meta-learning system is trying to solve. Okay. So the, the computational problem is uh, how do we form a posterior distribution over what this f is? And then how do we form a posterior predictive distribution uh, over outputs given a test input and given, and given the posterior over f? Right. So, um, so this is a kind of a different picture, which is perhaps in a, 
in a different uh, language of graphical models, which may, perhaps uh, some of you guys are familiar with, although I, I'm kind of not sure. I think about 10, 20 years ago, every student in machine learning would know the language of graphical models, although it's not clear to me that that's the case now. Um, anyways, what a graphical model is, is uh, we have basically a graph where we have nodes denoted by circles and arrows, which basically uh, describe kind of a statistical dependence of y given x. So, so an arrow means that this random variable depends on that random variable. Okay. And then we have this kind of rectangular things, which are called plates. And what a plate does is basically you can think of this as a stack of these things, one, uh, one uh, subgraph here, xi goes to yi, where i ranges from one to n in this case. So it's a plate over the training data. And then similarly, we have a plate over the test data. Um, and we can represent latent variables in the graphical model. Uh, and this f here is, a, is an unobserved uh, a random variable, which describes what the task is. And in the case of supervised learning, uh, f here corresponds to basically a, uh, a predictor. Okay, here I'm visualizing that as a decision boundary between the plus classes and the zero classes. Okay, so this is kind of coming from here. Right, and then in a graphical model, um, we might observe certain random variables. So in this case, the axes are always observed and they are fixed to the observed values. We observe the, the uh, training outputs y and we'd like to compute the posterior over this unobserved random variable f. And then given that posterior, we can then make predictions on the test output given a test input. Okay. Integrating over the posterior over f. Okay. And of course, whenever I talk about kind of graphical models and random variables, then you know one thing we could we have to think about is you know what is this what is this prior over our, our random variables? Okay. So in the case here, it's a prior over functions f, which maps from inputs to outputs for our supervised learning problem. Okay. And a prior is simply some distribution, and f here is a function, and the prior over functions is a distribution over functions and um, that's what's referred to as a stochastic process. It's simply, you can think of it as a distribution over functions. Okay, and one of the most popular, uh, just to give kind of, uh, 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 kind of a uh, concrete example of what such a stochastic process is, uh, distribution over functions is uh, an example of a distribution over functions is given by a Gaussian process. And it's called a Gaussian process because um, it, has marginals which are uh, Gaussian distributions. Okay. So, um, so what? Uh, what's this? So, uh, so we have a Gaussian process. So it's simply a random function, and you could say, okay, given some a collection of input uh, vectors x one to x t, um, you could think about what is the function evaluated at x one to xt, so f of x1, f of x2, all the way into f of xt. If, so x here is not random, but f is random. So you can think of this as a random vector, okay. as a random finite dimensional vector. And if it's the case that any such finite random dimensional, sorry, if any such finite dimensional random vector, has the Gaussian distribution, then we say that the, our function is, uh, our random function is a Gaussian process. Okay? And if it's Gaussian, then it's specified by a mean and specified by a covariance matrix. And in the case of a Gaussian process, this mean vector here is uh, also um, a vector formed by evaluating some mean function on the corresponding collection of input vectors. So mu of x1 to mu of xt. So that is our mean vector uh, for our Gaussian. And the covariance matrix is similarly uh, given by evaluating a covariance function k uh, 
on pairs of our input factors. So we have x11, x21, or the to xt, xt. Okay. So this is a covariance matrix. And depending on the choice of the covariance matrix, we can get different forms for our Gaussian process with different properties. Okay. So here's an example where you, we use a squared exponential kernel. And here's an example, which is a, uh, uh, in this case, it's, um, what's it called again? Um, uh, a Wiener process, basically. Okay. Uh, and then here's another example where we have a quadratic kernel. And if it's the case of a quadratic kernel, actually the functions look like quadratics and they're kind of random quadratic functions. That's a very nice book by uh, Carl Rasmussen and Chris Williams uh, that uh, describes Gaussian processes in machine learning. Okay, so here, what I've done here is I've kind of said that we have a stochastic process, it's a Gaussian process, if its finite dimensional marginal distributions are Gaussian distributed. And in general, that's true that the way we specify a stochastic process is by specifying its finite dimensional marginal distributions. Okay, basically we're specifying the distributions of the function evaluated at this at a finite collection of input points. Okay. And the um, theory that underlies this is basically a theory from, um, I guess, um, probability. Um, uh, and the kind of the corresponding theorem, kind of the most basic one is called the Komogorov extension theorem. Okay. So here's uh, the way that the Kolmogorov extension theorem defines a stochastic process. So as I said before, a stochastic process is a joint distribution over this infinite collection of random variables. Okay, so it's an infinite collection because we have for each x in our input space, f of x is a random variable and this is an infinite collection of random variables because this input space could be infinite, uh, could be countable or even uncountable least sized. Um, okay. Right, so the Kolmogorov extension theorem allows us to construct a stochastic process by specifying its finite dimensional marginal distributions in the same way that we do with Gaussian processes. Um, and the way we do this is um, the following. So we are gonna uh, first describe a family of finite dimensional joint distributions. So, so rho here is a, is a joint distribution, okay, over uh, the um, basically, yeah, it says it's a joint distribution and it's one for each and it's indexed by uh, a sequence, a finite sequence of input vectors. So x1 to xn, each of the x's come from our input space and the length here is arbitrary, uh, some arbitrary natural number n. And rho is indexed, rho is some distribution and is indexed by x1 to xn. Okay. And what the idea here is that we want rho x1 to xn to form the marginal distribution of our stochastic process. So we want rho of x1 to xn evaluated at y1 to yn to be the probability of that f of x1 equals to y1 f of x2 equals to y2 all the way until f of xn equals to yn. Right, so of course, not all families of finite dimensional joint distributions are uh, marginals of a stochastic process. Okay? And it turns out that there are two properties that you need for such a family of finite dimensional joint distributions for them to be marginals of some stochastic process. And what the Kolmogorov extension theorem says is that if both of these properties, uh, exchangeability and consistency holds for our family, then there is some stochastic process whose marginals are given by these joint distributions. Okay, so exchangeability and consistency. So what are these two properties? So exchangeability says that for each n, and each sequence x1 to xn, if we have a permutation of the index and we permute the input sequence, okay, then the joint distribution 
uh, of y1 to yn actually stays unchanged if we kind of permute this. So the, the way to think about this is that we have two joint distributions, rho x1 to xn, and we have another joint distribution, rho x pi1 to x pi n, and they should be consistent with each other. They should be, in fact, the same okay, a distribution. So this is called exchangeability. And finally, uh, the second property is consistency. And what this says is that if we take the marginal distribution over a larger collection of input-output pairs, so here we have n plus m input-output pairs, and we integrate over, in the sense that the, uh, the test outputs, then we get the original, then we get the marginal distribution over the uh, prefix of the sequence. Okay. So of course, both of these properties has to hold uh, for the marginal distributions uh, of a stochastic process. And what the Komorogov extension theorem says is that if we have a family of such uh, joint distributions that satisfies both of these properties, then they are, then you can construct a stochastic process such that this family of distributions are the marginals of this stochastic process. Okay. Right. Um, and okay. And I guess the study of stochastic processes is uh, uh, is uh, uh, um, there's lots of uh, probabilists and um, theoretical uh, statisticians who, who who study this. And in machine learning, that's cover quite a large area that uh, has been looking at of people who are interested in kind of stochastic processes as well. And I guess this area is often uh, referred to as uh, Bayesian non parametric And basically this is an area where, you know, there's lots of people who have studied different stochastic processes and used them for different things. So we see that there's a, we already saw Gaussian processes. These are used for uh, most popularly for regression and classification. We have the uh, Dirichlet processes, which have been used for clustering, particularly for infinite mixture models. So the idea here is that we have, uh, uh, this is a approach to clustering where uh, um, as your data set grows, you can always introduce new clusters into your, uh, into your mixture model. Okay. Um, and then we have things like hierarchical Dirichlet processes, which have been used for topic models and in hidden Markov models. We have things like pitman yaw processes and poisson kingman processes, which have been used to study kind of power law behaviors, language models, and also species discovery problems. And then finally, we have uh, also some of these power law structures have been used in uh, to model basically sparse network models. Um, so I guess, but uh, I just can't refer to this. Uh, if you're interested, you could refer to, to some of this uh, literature. Um, what uh, this tutorial is about is about meta-learning and what does Bayesian non parametrics what do stochastic processes have to do with meta-learning? Right, so um, coming back to specifying stochastic processes, we see that in the case of a Gaussian process, we can specify what a Gaussian process is in terms of its marginal distributions. We can also equivalently specify a Gaussian process through its conditional distributions. So the idea here is that given uh, input-output pairs for our function, so x1, y1 to xt, yt, um, we can specify a Gaussian process in terms of its conditional distribution of, and on, uh, of the output given some test input, xt plus 1. And in the case of a Gaussian process, it has to be Gaussian as well. And this is the form of the, of the conditional distribution. And in general, stochastic processes can also be described using a consistent family of conditional distributions. Okay? Um, so basically, given, uh, uh, given a training set, we're conditioning the uh, function evaluated at the training inputs to be equal to the training outputs. And conditioning on the training set, we would like to compute the conditional distribution over the test output given the test input. 
Okay, and this family has to be consistent uh, in kind of in the same way as actually uh, here. Okay. Cool. Right. So what we say is that a stochastic process can be described using a consistent family of conditional distributions. And if you think about this thing here, that conditional distribution is exactly what is being learned by the base learner in a meta-learning system. Okay. So coming back to a conditional neural process, what we're trying to learn is this conditional distribution. Okay. And, and so what this says is that if a conditional distribution if a family of conditional distributions describe a stochastic process, then a uh, meta-learning system learns this conditional distributions, then you can say that actually a meta-learning system aims to learn the, the stochastic process. Okay. And that's uh, why we call this a neural process in the sense that it's a, neural, it's a stochastic process that's whose conditional distributions are parameterized by a neural network. And it's called conditional because what we are learning are these conditional distributions. Okay. Cool. So I'd just like to show some examples. So this should work. Okay. So here, um, let me see what, okay, yeah. So here, each task here is a function on a 1D space. So we have an input space on the x-axis and the output is the y-axis. Given training input-output pairs, we train a neural process to predict the mean and the standard deviation of the function values at other locations. And that's visualized by the blue, uh, by, the, by the kind of the, blue line in the middle, that's the mean. And the width of this thing here, of the kind of blue region, is the, uh, basically visualizes the standard deviation of our, of our prediction. Okay. Um, and it's uh, trained uh, to reproduce the predictions, in this case, of a, of a Gaussian process. And we see that the um, initially, um, actually, I'm trying to stop this. Okay, it'd be useful, so. Okay, so initially, in the uh, if we are given a small data set, so here we have two input-output pairs in our training sets, then the prediction of the neural process is certain around where the training data is, and uncertain away from where the training data, which is kind of exactly what you like to to see in the case of the Gaussian process. Okay, and then as we increase the number of training points, so here we have four training points then the, uh, the predictions of the neural process become more certain around where we have training data and less certain where we away from where we have training data. Okay. And as we have, and as we have a tra our training set increase, our certainty about the function, uh, about the function also improves as well. You can see that this is improving. Okay. Um, and the black line here is of course the true underlying function. Uh, which we can converge to as our training data, in, um, uh, as our as our training data kind of increases in size. Okay. Um, you can do this for not just one-dimensional functions, but also two-dimensional functions. So here's an application to uh, actually image completion and super resolution. Uh, so the idea here is that each task here corresponds to an image, which we can think of as a function on a, on a 2D space. And in um, over here, what we do is we observe the function in the first half of the of the image, and we ask the neural process to fill in what how does the bottom half look like. And then in this case here, we have a higher resolution image but we only observe at this four by four grid of pixels across this image. And we ask the neural process to basically fill in the rest of the pixels based on these observations here. 
And the neural process in this case is trained on face images from, I think, Celeb A data set. Um, so it, of course, fills in with, with what it has learned on, which is uh, uh, face images. Okay. And of course, if you condition only on a four by four grid of pixels, or if you condition only on the top half of the image, there's a lot of uncertainty about how the bottom half looks like, or how, or how the image as a whole looks like as, as well. And we can visualize the uncertainty that the neural process has um, given this limited uh, context set or the training set of like only 16 pixels, for example. And we can visualize this by visualizing different uh, completions of the image uh, uh, that is produced by the neural process. Okay, um, so here's a, kind of a, a picture of this. So, um, uh, right. So here's an example where we have, um, and we have a, um, uh, actually, it, we just look at the, the right side. So in each of this, the context here is our training set. So we have a, a, a collection of um, pixel locations and the corresponding color of each pixel. And here we have a low resolution image and we ask the neural process to, to basically do super resolution to fill in how the how a res high resolution image might look like given this low resolution image. And so here we have different uh, low resolution images and the neural process fills in um, the image. And you can see that it's quite interesting because, so for example, if you look at the eye here, right? So this low resolution image is so low resolution that you can't see the whites of the eye, but the neural process, because it's trained on the collection of face images, it knows enough about the, about the structure of the problem that actually it could fill in that, you know, the eye has bits of the eye which looks white, okay? And we're comparing, in this case, the predictions of a neural process with um, uh, kind of predictions given by some baselines which basically take this low resolution image and just interpolate them using a cubic spline or something. You can see that it's producing, it's giving more structure to, to the face image. Right. Um, so, um, so what I've described is this sort of conditional neural process where given a context set or given a training set, it produces a prediction on a test set where given each test input, we have a test output, which is uh, the whose conditional distribution is given by a normal distribution uh, with some mean and variance, which are given by this G function of the training set and the test input as well. Okay. So, and if you go back to the applications here, um, actually, how do I go back? Yeah, okay. Um, so one thing that I've kind of like glossed over is the fact that um, here we are kind of like filling in the rest of the test function and we can see that there's actually dependence in, in, the, in, in the function itself. Uh, basically the function values on the test uh, input points. Uh, but under the conditional neural process, actually uh, there's no, uh, the test outputs here are actually independent. Okay. Um, so basically we're kind of assuming that the conditional distributions on the test outputs are independent, conditionally independent given the training set and the corresponding test inputs. Uh, but actually to, to have a proper stochastic process, we need to model the dependence across this test outputs. Okay. Uh, one simple thing you could do is to actually do this in a sequential way. So you could say, instead of predicting all of this all at once, we could actually first predict what Y4 looks like, condition on Y1 to Y3 and X4. And then given Y4, we can then put it into the training part, into the training set, and then predict Y5 given X1, Y1 to X4, Y4, and then 
given that predicted y5, we put it back into the, put it into the training set and then we can predict y6 given x6. So this is a sequential way of making a prediction which uh, automatically um, induces dependencies across y4, y5, and y6. But, but of course, it's not computationally as efficient. Okay. Um, so what we could do is to kind of go back to this uh, generative process view, right? Of a, a generative a model view. So here we have a generative process um, where we have a task which is, is which is our latent variable, which is unobserved, and we are conditioning on the training set, computing the posterior over f, and then uh, predicting by uh, computing the posterior predictive distribution. So that's the generative process. We can actually model this by saying that actually we could uh, you introduce a latent variable z, which is going to be a latent variable which describes what f is. And we're going to assume that our data is iid. Uh, well, not it's they are independent but not identical because we're conditioning on different training on different input uh, vectors. But each of the outputs is conditionally independent given Z and given their corresponding inputs. And the model is as follows. So we are gonna assume that Z is our latent variable that describes our stochastic process and following you know standard uh, methodology of uh, variational autoencoders we're going to assume that z is going to be normally distributed with the standard normal distribution zero mean and identity covariance and each uh, conditional distribution of yi given xi and z is going to be normally distributed with a mean and variance given by some neural network which is produced given inputs of z and xi. Okay. So that's our generative model. And we can learn this generative model by optimizing uh, an, an objective function, which is simply our the log probability of the outputs given the inputs. Okay. And of course, this log probability of the outputs given the inputs is uh, an intractable quantity because uh, because the we the prob the joint distribution of the outputs given the inputs we have to integrate over z and there's some nonlinear uh, neural network uh, which relates the latent variable to the y i's here so this so this probability here involves an integral over z and that integral is intractable. But again, following standard uh, variational auto -en encoder type of approach, we can form a variational lower bound on this log probability. Okay. And the variational lower bound uh, has the following form. Basically, we introduce a variational posterior distribution, Q of Z given inputs and outputs. And this quantity here, it, uh, the expectation of this quantity actually is a lower bound on the log probability. Okay. Um, I think Shakir Muhammad uh, later this week will actually go into a lot more detail on in in this sort of things. Okay. Right, and once we form this lower bound, we can then optimize this, and this is a tractable lower bound. So we're going to parameterize our variational posterior using a neural network, and we're going to parameterize our predictive distribution using a neural network G. We're going to optimize the parameters of both of these uh, neural networks um, by maximizing this uh, variational variational objective function. Okay. Yeah. So as I said, we're going to parameterize our variational posterior using a neural network as well. And the form of this neural network is the following. So we're going to take our input-output pairs, uh, pass it through a neural network, we're going to average them. This is the, uh, the, the left side of the, our base learner, right? And we're going to pass that through another neural network, which then outputs the mean and the variance of, of Z, of the, post, of the approximate posterior for Z. Okay. 
and 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 we can optimize uh, with respect to the parameters of the G, F, and S and neural network. Okay. Um, so alternate. So um, actually, let me go back to here. Actually. So and this is a a completely sensible variational objective function which we can optimize. Um, Unfortunately, there's one thing which uh, it doesn't satisfy, which is that it's it's not it doesn't satisfy this property of uh, this tenets of meta learning, where we want our meta learning procedure uh, to be based on this principle that the test and the train conditions must match, right? And during test conditions, we are basically given a test task, we are only given the training data and would like to make predictions on the test data. So an alternative learning objective is to say, well, actually this is the objective that we want. Okay. So we have the log of the conditional distribution of, uh, of the test outputs given the training data and the test inputs. And of course, this objective is also intractable because it involves uh, integral over uh, the posterior distribution over Z, given the training data. Uh, but we can form a variational lower bound on, on this objective uh, as before. So we're gonna introduce a variational posterior Q and this here is gonna be a lower bound on that objective that we want to optimize. Um, Unfortunately, actually, even this objective is actually intractable because the this term here, which used to be the prior over Z, which is just a standard normal, is now actually the posterior over Z given the training data. Okay. And we said that the posterior is intractable because uh, there are kind of non-linearities in the system. Um, so what we do here is, is we could actually Kind of approximate this and say that the true posterior is going to be approximately the variational posterior given only the training data. Okay. And now this whole thing is going to be tractable and it's going to be an approximate lower bound on this objective that we care about, but we can still optimize this. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is... Uh, um, uh, um, what's called... Uh, a, a, a neural process, okay, right. So, um, so that kind of, um, so just to kind of recap about what I've just talked about. So what I've been talking about is this idea that actually meta learning is simply about learning the prior over distribution over functions. So in other words, we're actually trying to learn a stochastic process. And if you think about what a prior is in the Bayesian language, a prior corresponds to the inductive biases. We, it corresponds to prior knowledge about our system um, uh, that is typically kind of built in by hand. So we, uh, right. And basically what meta learning is because it's learning this prior over functions it's actually, you could think of this as actually meta learning the inductive bias from our meta training sets. Okay. So what this says is that you can think of meta learning as it's a different way of actually uh, putting inductive biases into our system by, by learning. Okay. And another thing that to note is that actually the base learner that we have in, in a meta learning system can be thought of as um, uh, an amortized learning system. So this is amortized learning uh, as compared to amortized inference. So in things like variational autoencoders, we have a posterior that is uh, intractable, but we can use a neural network to approximate a po the posterior distribution and that's called amortized inference. So we are kind of like um, learning a neural network to produce an approximation to our posterior distribution. And in this case of meta learning, you can think of the base learner as actually an amortization procedure, which actually learns uh, the um, this mapping between training inputs 
uh, training data and test outputs. Right. Um, something else that's important uh, in taking this prob probabilistic perspective on meta learning is that uh, you know in many meta learning applications like few shot learning, our training data is often quite small. So actually, we should have quite a lot of uncertainty about what our function actually is, right? And that uncertainty can be quite important if we're trying to solve problems that are not just about prediction problems, okay? So for example, we might be interested in active learning where we might choose, which, uh, choose where we want to observe our function in order to learn our function as quickly as possible. Uh, we might be interested in Bayesian optimization where we have some unknown function and we might want to try to decide uh, where to, how to, uh, basically uh, Bayesian optimization is a procedure where we try to minimize a function by evaluating it, and it on as few uh, locations as possible. And finally, it might be important in reinforcement learning as well because it, so one of the issues in reinforcement learning is this exploration exploitation trade-off, which has to do with kind of, uh, kind of what we know about the environment okay, versus what we don't know about the environment. And one of the issues with reinforcement learning is, is we have an agent that's operating in an environment that it doesn't know uh, everything about. So it needs to explore in the environment in order to exploit it in the future. Right. Right, so um, yes, so as I was saying, uh, in the case of meta learning, often case, oftentimes the training set is small. So there should be uncertainty in actually what we know about the task. And, that, and that's important in, in different scenarios. Um, so I'd like to kind of, um, so here's kind of a visualization. So previously, you know, we just have a single function that we are making a prediction, but actually, you know, the function, the form of the function itself should be quite uncertain because our training data is quite small. Okay. And that uncertainty can be important if we want to make robust, well calibrated uh, predictions or we might want to do things like active learning, based optimization or reinforcement learning. So uh, in the rest of this section, I would like to kind of give a few examples of how this can be achieved um, using uh, neural processes. Okay. So just to like to give an example in uh, applying neural processes to efficient model-based reinforcement learning. So um, what's reinforcement learning basically if you have an agent that's interacting with some environments, the agent has in, so uh, is interacting with the environment um, over time. After t interactions with the environments, we may have uh, some uh, basically at each iteration t, the agent has some observation of the history of its interactions up until that point in time it decides to take some action AT and it might, uh, it takes the action, um, right? So actually I should, I should just move on to this. So, uh, so it takes an action uh, and the environment then produces an observation and a reward, okay? Um, at each point in time, the agent has its history and it would like to form basically an estimate with uncertainties about what it knows about the environment in terms of the transition dynamics, as well as what the rewards are about this, uh, about this environment. And then with both, of, both estimates of the reward function and the transition dynamics, it can form a plan and then it can take an action in the environment. So there's this thing that kind of feeds the environment feeds the states and rewards back into the agent and then the agent then can, can plan. Okay. Um, and basically uh, what we can do is to say, well, you know, we can think about this bit here as uh, we can use meta learning to actually do this where given a collection of training input output pairs. So the input output pairs consists of 
The inputs are the history up, up until that point in time and the action that the agent takes. And the output is the next observation and the next reward. Um, and the functions that it's trying to learn are the transition dynamics and the reward function. Okay. Right. Um, and if we have a collection of, um, of environments that are similar in some way, then we could kind of meta learn a procedure that can produce um, this uh, estimates for us. Okay. Um, and here's an example where uh, we have a neural process that you know uh, can learn very quickly because it has meta learned uh, to make good predictions based on a small amount of training data. Um, actually, I like to. Okay, so here's a visualization of what's happening. So uh, we have a system, which is this cut pole system. The, the aim of the system is simply to, uh, the agent can kind of move um, the, uh, this bit here forward and backward. And the aim is to move the stick up as high as possible. Okay. And to, 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 to keep it kind of pointing up. Okay. And we are comparing, uh, uh, our model-based neural process-based uh, model-based RL system with kind of either model-free or another model-based system, but using, um, I think, uh, in this case, it's mammal. Okay, and you can compare this against uh, Gaussian processes as well. Right, so you can see that the neural process can learn very quickly uh, because it has a, a very good. Um, model of, of how tasks here look like. Um, so here's another uh, example of um, using a neural process for Bayesian optimization. So here's the problem where we have trained some powerful um, RL agents to solve some tasks. And this is a task that's visualized as a maze. And the task is simply to go from a start position to a goal position. Uh, and the problem here is to try to find mazes that are as difficult as possible for our RL agent, right? So because, you know, we're interested in agents that can uh, um, solve this, uh, this collection of problems very quickly to figure out how to navigate from a start position to a goal position. And we'd like to evaluate how well did our RL agent learn. And to do that, we'd like to do to see what is the worst case scenario. So what, what's the worst that the agent could do in terms of are there mazes that actually kind of stumps the agent? Okay. And you can think of this as a Bayesian optimization problem where, um, where we're trying to um, basically minimize the reward that the agent gets. Uh, we're minimizing over the maze, the start location and the goal location given the RL agents. Um, and if we have lots of examples where we have an agent and it's given a, a maze, a start location, a goal location, and it's obtained some reward, then we would like to kind of minimize this, this thing here. Okay. So this is in a sense an adversarial testing of our um, RL agents. Um, right. And um, so here's something that the... Uh, This should be a kind of little video. Basically, um, uh, we have a system that tries to find a maze that our agent does really badly on. Okay, so at the first situation, it, it found this maze, which turns out the agent is does really well. It just goes from start location to the goal location in a straight line. That's easy to do. On the fifth iteration, it finds a maze that the agent kind of like went around a few times before finding, the, before finding the location. And then by the 10th iteration, it found a maze that's kind of confusing for the agent. So the agent just goes round and round in this bit of the maze and never actually finds the goal location. Okay. Um, and here's a kind of, a, in a sense, an optimization curve where over iterations of a, a Bayesian optimization procedure, um, we kind of, manage to find mazes that stumps our agent 
very quickly compared to other procedures. Okay, uh, so that so that's kind of a, a, a few examples of uh, why kind of uncertainty is important in in meta learning and and kind of this probabilistic perspective on meta learning, which could be uh, quite useful. So in the last bit of the talk, actually, I'd like to spend a few. Uh, uh, minutes talking about this idea of probabilistic symmetries and neural architectures. Okay. So just coming back to this uh, neural processes, we see that the architecture of the neural process, we've kind of like built the architecture such that it has this invariance with respect to the permutations of the training sets. Okay. And it has this, architect this particular architecture where we take each training input output pair, we, we pass it through some function to produce some embeddings, and then we aggregate those embeddings together to form some representation of the task. And the aggregation procedure is the mean over the uh, um, embeddings. Okay. And the question is, well, is this a general procedure or are there other architectures that also has permutation invariance? Okay. Um, right, so I'd like to kind of abstract this a bit. So what we are interested in is some neural network H, okay, that maps from an input sequence of length n to an output um, to an output y, okay. And what we like to do is to have a neural network architecture such that uh, if we permute the input sequence, then the output H stays unchanged. So H of the permutation of x1 to xn is equal to H of x1 to xn. Okay. And the questions that we'd like to ask are, can we characterize the class of permutation invariant function classes or neural networks? And if we, yeah, so if we use neural networks to parameterize permutation invariant functions, how should we choose the architecture? And given the architecture choice, can the neural network approximate well any arbitrary permutation invariant function? Okay. Um, so, so, and in a sense, the, this sort of architecture is uh, basically the simplified version of this neural process architecture that we have, where we have the inputs, we pass the input vector through some neural network to produce some embedding, and then we're gonna aggregate it in some way, and then pass through a second neural network that produces the output. Okay. But of course, this is not the only uh, architecture that we could use, for example, we could, uh, for this uh, aggregating operation, we could choose the mean as in neural processes. We could take uh, the sum, we can take the product, we can take element-wise product, element-wise max, element-wise min, or even the median as well. And all of this, uh, of course, permutation invariance and produces the permutation invariant function in the end. Okay. We can also do things like the following, where instead of taking each of this embedding operations, instead of taking single uh, elements of our training sequence, each of them can take a pair of, of, the, of the inputs and produce some embedding of the pair. And we can do this over all pairs. And then we fit that into our aggregation operation and then produces an output Y. And that's of course also permutation invariance as well. And the question is, you know, uh, in general, what is the most general form for a permutation invariant function that we could come up with? Okay. Um, so um, I'd like to kind of make a few definitions on um, actually some of these symmetry properties that we might care about. So we might care about not just permutation invariance, but also what's called permutation equivariance. So and what a permutation equivariant function is, is as follows. So it's now gonna, the function is now going to produce, take as input a sequence, and now it's going to produce an output sequence as well. So h of x1 to xn is going to be y1 to yn. Okay. And this function h is permutation equivariance if, uh, if uh, the following holds. So, um, if we permute our input um, sequence, then 
and then we apply H to that, to that permuted input sequence, then the output should be the permutated, should be the permuted output sequence. Okay, so, and it should be permuted in the same way. So in other words, in this pi and H kind of commutes with each other. So we, if we apply pi first followed by H, that's the same as applying H first followed by pi. Okay, and in general, uh, instead of permutations, we could think about a group G that's acting on some input space X. In this case, the input space is our actually a space of sequences. And, it, and this group G is acting on an input space X and also a corresponding output space Y. And we say that our H function is G invariance. So it's invariant with respect to the actions of this group. If H applied to kind of this, uh, um, action of G on X uh, is the same as H applied to X. So basically, if we transform X using G, then that doesn't change the output of the function. So uh, just to give a concrete example, X could be an image, G could be translation, and uh, our image classifier should be invariant to translating our image uh, in, by G. Um, we say that H is G equivariance if, uh, if we apply H to a translated image X, then that's the same as if we had applied H to X and then translated the output image. So a convolution layer, for example, is translation equivariance. Okay. So this is uh, symmetry properties, invariance and equivariance. Uh, properties of some deterministic function H, and we can generalize this symmetry properties to uh, symmetry properties to on distributions. Okay, and this is actually uh, uh, the study of probabilistic symmetries. Okay, so we say that um, so we've already actually encountered this notion of exchangeability. So we if we have a sequence x1 to xn, we say that a joint distribution p over this random sequence is exchangeable if this p is invariant to permutations of x1 to xn. Okay. So in, in other words, the probability of x1 to xn is exactly equal to the probability of, of the, uh, basically uh, the permutation of x1 to xn. So it's x pi 1 to x pi n. Um, right, and basically, yeah, ex exchangeability, this notion of exchangeability, which is very well studied in uh, stochastic processes and probability, is basically permutation and invariance of this joint distribution P. Okay. Um, and if you're familiar with Bayesian non parametrics, there's this uh, theorem called Definitis Theorem, which says that. Um, uh, yeah, so I actually have to define what is infinite exchangeable. So if we have a sequence of random variables that's uh, infinite in length, then this sequence is infinitely exchangeable if all length and prefixes are exchangeable. Okay, and definitely this theorem says that if we have an exchangeable sequence, if we have an infinitely exchangeable sequence, then that's correspond that corresponds to this conditionally IID structure where we have some random distribution Q conditioned on which XIs are actually IID. Okay. So this is a unconditional version of that Kolmogorov extension theorem that I've described. Okay. And we can uh, extend this notion of uh, uh, permutation invariance to uh, permutation equivariance and also in general invariance and equivariance with respect to some group G. Okay, and to do that, uh, we can do the uh, describe the following. So we suppose that we have some conditional distribution of some random variable y given x. Okay, and this conditional distribution we can think of as a stochastic relaxation of a deterministic function, which is y equals to h of x. And we say that our conditional distribution is G invariant if 
uh, the conditional distribution stays unchanged if we uh, if we transform x by g. So basically, the probability of y given x is the same as the probability of y given g of x, uh, given g applied to x. And then similarly, we say that the conditional distribution is g equivariant if we transform, if the conditional distribution of y given x is equal to the conditional distribution of y transformed by g, conditional on x transformed by g. Okay, so if we permute x by, by, by some permutation g, then the output should also be permuted by, by the same permutation as well. Okay, or if we translate our image x by, by some amount g, then the output of our convolutional layer should be uh, translated by the same amounts. Okay. And the question is, can we characterize the class of permutation invariance conditional distributions? Um, it turns out that there's a, a kind of an easy answer to this. Uh, and the answer is given by the following. So uh, uh, there's an important property here called the empirical measure. Okay. And the given the input sequence x1 to xn, the empirical measure is simply the sum over delta functions one on each xi. Okay. And this uh, is kind of the empirical measure corresponding to this um, uh, to our to our input sequence x one to x n. Um, right, and um, it turns out that the empirical measure is what's known as a sufficient statistics. Okay, and in other words, a joint distrib a distribution sorry a joint distribution p over x1 to xn, over our sequence of length n, is exchangeable if and only if the conditional distribution of actually our sequence x1 to xn, conditioned on it having an empirical measure, is the same as is kind of, is given by this uniform distribution over all sequences x1 to xn, with the same empirical measure of n. Okay. So in other words, what this is saying is that um, if we, uh, so how to say this, okay. Our joint distribution is exchangeable if uh, knowing the empirical measure, then in a sense, we know all about our joints, about our sequence x1 to xn, right? In the sense that, um, except for the uh, ordering among x1 to xn. And kind of, uh, what this thing is kind of saying is that if our joint distribution is exchangeable, then we don't care about the order. And if we get rid of the ordering among x1 to xn, then all that we have left is the empirical measure. That's why it's called sufficient statistics because it is describing everything about the axis except for the permutation among the axis. Right, and um, there's a second kind of uh, prob uh, 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 idea from probability, which turns out to be useful. It's called noise outsourcing. Okay, and this property is, in a sense, quite um, uh, um, intuitive. Okay, so suppose that we have two, two random variables x one to x n. Okay, then we can actually describe the joint distribution, actually the conditional distribution of y given x in the following way. So we have some random variable, eta, okay, which is simply a uniform uh, random variable on zero one. And eta is gonna be condition, is uh, actually independent on, on x. And we have some function h, okay. And basically we can write y as some deterministic function h that takes as input x and this, uh, this random variable um, eta. Okay. Um, so the, it, this thing is quite intuitive in the sense, in the following sense. So 
um, for any pair of sufficiently nice random variables, we can describe the conditional distribution of y given x as in a generative way where we have a function h that is a deterministic function and it takes as input some random noise eta, which effectively captures all the randomness in y that is not captured by x, right? And then uh, this deterministic function just computes our corresponding y given this random noise and given x. Okay. Right. And suppose that there's some um, statistics, which is uh, what's called adequate statistics. Okay. So a, a statistic is simply some function of x and an adequate statistics is one where x and y are conditionally independent given s of x. Okay. Then we can write y as a function h of our outsourced noise eta and the adequate statistics. Okay. Um, okay. Right. So, um, so the uh, kind of the statement that I'd like to make is the following. So suppose now that we have random variables, x, n, and y, okay, uh, and we assume that y is conditionally permutation invariant given x, n, so it's invariant to permutations of our input sequence, and we assume that our input sequence is also marginally per permutation invariant as well then you can show that the empirical measure is a sufficient statistics of xn and it's an adequate statistics for y given xn. Okay. Um, right, so if we assume that, uh, um, well, and not that we, we can also show that the empirical measure is an adequate statistics of y given xn. Okay. So in other words, the conditional distribution of y given uh, xn is equal to the conditional distribution of y given its empirical measure. Okay. In other words, x and y are conditionally independent given the empirical measure. And in this case, we can apply now the uh, theorem about the noise outsourcing as we, we have before. And then what we get is that we can write y as a deterministic function of outsourced noise and the empirical measure. So what is this saying? Uh, what this saying is the following. So we take each of our axes, our, our input x, we're gonna embed it into an infinite dimensional space of measures by basically computing a kind of a point mass or delta function one on each input element of our input sequence. We're gonna sum them together. That's what the empirical measure is. It's a sum of the delta functions. And then we have another part of the system, h here, which takes as input the empirical measure and some outsourced noise and produces a y, okay? Right. So, and what this uh, theorem that I've just kind of described to you before is saying is that given any y which is invariant to permutations of the input sequence, then we can write y as some nonlinear function of outsourced noise and the empirical measure. And this is exactly the structure that we have. Okay. And in the case where y is not a stochastic function of x, of the input sequence x1 to xn, but rather is a deterministic function, then what that simply says is that it doesn't actually depend on, the out, on any outsourced noise and we can kind of uh, get rid of it, okay? And in general, uh, if we have some uh, some function, some y, which is invariant to our input sequence, then we can write y as uh, a function of exactly this functional form, where we take each input factor x, we pass it through some nonlinear function, producing some embedding in some potentially infinite dimensional space. We sum those up and then we pass it through another function and that gives us y. Okay. So what this says is that 
any permutation invariant function has to have this form. Okay. Um, right. Uh, I think I'm kind of running out of time. So you can kind of do the same for permutation equivariance as well. Um, um, basically, if we have some uh, sequence of y and a sequence of x's, some joint distribution over them, and we assume that our y ends, our y sequence is conditionally permutation equivariance given our input sequence x1 to xn. And if our input sequence is also marginal permutation invariance, and if we also assume that the y's are additionally conditionally uh, mutually independent given the input sequence, then we can write, uh, there's kind of a outsourcing theorem which says that we can write the output sequence of y1 to yn given the input sequence x1 to xn in the following form. Basically, we have some function h and y, each yi can be written as h applied to eta i and the corresponding xi and the empirical measure. Okay, right. So the structure of this is as follows. So each y is, can be written as the same function h that takes as input uh, the empirical measure, the corresponding x, and some outsourced noise, which are conditionally independent given the axis and also mutually independent among themselves. Okay. Then we get this sort of structure. Okay. And you can think of this as a neural network where we have a module here, which is a permutation invariance module, which describes some joint property of the input sequence. And the output here is some, the same neural network applied to each corresponding input and this joint property. Okay. And then put additionally with some noise in the case where we have a stochastic y given x. Right. Um, so that's kind of the statement of the theorem, which kind of says that any, uh, basically any permutation, any uh, function, which is permutation equivariance has to have this form. Okay. And any conditional distribution, which is permutation equivariance also has to have this form if the y's are conditionally independent given the axis. Okay, so, um, and now that we have kind of this structure of invariance modules and equivariance modules, we can kind of compose them in, in, in different ways. So I'm gonna kind of abstract this. So if we have an invariant uh, module, so this whole thing here, I can read, write as an invariance module where, you know, we, take our um, empirical measure and we apply some function to our empirical measure plus some outsourced noise and that's our invariant module. And similarly, this thing here, this whole thing here can be written as, as some equivariance module, which takes as input some input sequence and output some, some sequence and it's equivariant with respect to permutations of the input and the outputs. And then you could compose them in, in different ways. So for example, we see that we can actually replace our empirical measure with some invariance module and the whole thing is still equivariant. We can compose multiple equivariance modules together and that's the whole thing is, the composition is also equivariant. And we, if we comp compose an equivariance stack of modules with a final invariance module, then the output y is invariance with respect to the permutations of the axis. Okay. And this gives us, in a sense, a language to construct quite complicated, uh, uh, per, uh, quite compli complicated uh, neural networks, which are invariant or equivariant with respect to permutations of some input, input sequence. And that's kind of what's done in actually some uh, a few pieces of work that I was kind of involved in. Uh, so this is one called attentive neural process where um, it's a neural process uh, um, architecture, but the input process is actually kind of a stack of multiple 
permutation equivariance modules composed of kind of self-attention layers from the transformer uh, architecture. Uh, yeah, and then uh, this paper here is about kind of set transformers, which kind of explores this use of permutation in equivariance and in and in invariance transform architectures. And then the final paper here, which just appeared at ICML last week, is on actually kind of um, function, uh, meta learning using functional gradient descent, where we kind of compose uh, functional gradient updates in a permutation equivariant way. Um, um, I think yeah, we're running out of time. Yeah, we have four minutes left. Uh, yeah. but so I can go. Gonna, Mm -hmm. It's okay, I'm, I'm just gonna finish up. I'm just gonna skip through this, um, but there's kind of some more general theory around uh, what's called maximal invariance and maximal equivariance as well. Sure, sure, take time, take your time. I, we have 30 minutes more. No, okay. I think I'll just start wrapping up. So um, uh, in summary, um, uh, what I've kind of described here is that there are interesting tools from probabilistic symmetry and also from theoretical statistics on kind of sufficiency and adequacy, which allows us to kind of answer some questions around characterizing neural network architectures where we have some symmetry properties. Okay. And um, that's kind of a paper by Ben Bloom, Rady, and myself that we've explored. We've kind of extended this to graph and uh, an array structured data, but uh, there's kind of different things that we, the, one could explore as well. We could think about kind of continuous Lie groups, and we can think about how to relax assumptions on conditional independence of the, of the outputs. Okay, so uh, in summary, uh, what I've described in uh, the tutorial yesterday and today is kind of a, a description of you know what is meta learning, why do we want to do meta learning, um, and a few of the methods that people have proposed for doing meta learning. So optimization based and black box meta learning and this probabilistic perspective on meta learning, which leads to this notion that meta learning is, an, is about learning a stochastic Chiba, process. Chiba, Chiba, Chiba. Yes, Kifi, I'll come down soon. Okay, thank you. No, 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 Sorry. no, 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 <laughs> um, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, one thing that I've kind of skipped is kind of I haven't really talked about any uh, I, anything around meta meta learning in the reinforcement learning context, and that's still a, quite a big open problem. So, um, like to kind of just highlight some of the interesting recent developments around meta learning. Um, so, I think there's some question around you know how do you uh, uh, learn to meta learn to continual learn, and there's a bunch of papers there. Um, um, I said, how sorry, yeah, here, sorry. Um, and there's some interesting work on, um, I think, um, things like uh, using meta gradients, uh, basically, meta learning uh, gradient optimization in reinforcement learning. And there's some interesting work around modular meta learning where we've talked about kind of string cache as well. Uh, basically, if we understand that there are um, different tasks are different in kind of in a small number of ways from other tasks, then perhaps we might use string cache priors in a meta learning context. Okay. Um, so that we can kind of figure out how tasks are different. And there's also this interesting question around uh, whether things like MAML is actually really learning to rapidly learn or simply learning useful features. Um, and there's this interesting paper that also just came out uh, this year as well, I think in iClear. Um, what gradient descent is quite an interesting uh, optimization based um, meta learning system where you can think of uh, the system as basically trying to meta learn a preconditioner for stochastic gradient descent such that it generalizes well. And then uh, there was also some question yesterday in the round table about meta learning theory. And here I've kind of listed some, some work. Actually, two of these are works by Jonathan Baxter, which it seems that got put on archive actually very recently. 
um, even though some of this dates from much uh, uh, many years ago. And then finally, um, there's also recent papers on you know provable meta learning of linear representations that you might want to check out too. So I'd like to end with uh, thank you all for your attention uh, yesterday and today. And also I'd like to thank a lot of my collaborators over the years um, and mentors and also funding bodies and as well as a very nice research group of uh, computational stats and machine learning research group in Oxford. Thank you. Thanks, Yevaite, for a very nice lecture. Um, we have a couple of questions here. So do you want to read them in the chat or? Uh, okay, sure. Uh, so the first question was, uh, I thought in meta learning, we should have several tasks, which, we are, which are somehow linked. So I thought this was, this was corresponding to an extra plate around F with multiple F drawn according to some unknown latent rights. So um, actually, you're right. So actually, I need to stop my presentation. Uh, let's share screen still. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Um, no, uh, we cannot see it. Oh. Okay. Right. Uh, I think that that was the question related to. Um, to this graphical model. Yes, and uh, the question was, why is there no plate around this? And actually, the, there's a astute observation. Yes, there should be a plate on this, which maybe I should just draw if I can. Okay, so uh, yes. So there should be a, another plate around the task and around the whole thing. There's kind of another rectangle around this whole thing, but doesn't include the prior. Why if I, okay, cool, yes. Um, so we have another question, uh, which is a uh, little bit above in the chat. Yeah, yeah, so another question by Robert was, do you have another, do you have a good idea or intuition why LSTM based meta learning seems to yield base optimal information integration? and that does not seem to be an explicit base prior in gated recurrent networks, or is this simply the power of distributed representations and BPTT? And that's a very good question. Um, um, so the question is, um, so coming back to black box meta learning, right? So we have, this is a general architecture where given an input, given a training sequence, we'd like to produce an output and if we process this training sequence using an LSTM to produce a test output given a test input, uh, why is that base optimal? So the, the idea here is that uh, you, know, you can show that an, an LSTM, if, it's, if it has enough, uh, if the uh, latent dimensionality of the LSTM is rich enough, um, then it can learn any input output relationship between an input sequence and an output give uh, and the next output okay and if that's the case then you know um, the best that you could do is to learn the base optimal thing because it actually you can kind of show that yeah well effectively if you try to minimize the loss yeah if, if you um, sorry I don't have it here um, if you can write so if you write down the loss that you might want to do, which is simply the log probability of the test output given the test input and the training sets, and if that if the objective is this log probability, then and if your uh, function class is rich enough, then the base that, the best that, that you could do is simply this base optimal one. I think that's a pretty easy thing to to show. And the question is then to, to show that LSTM is also kind of, in a sense, a universal function approximator. And that's also uh, known as well in the, in the literature. Um, there's a discussion of this um, in a paper by Pedro Ortega uh, that came out in archive, I think, 
on archive. This is put on archive, I think, a year or two ago, um, which uh, I can. I'm happy to put it in the chat as well. Um, okay. Cool. Um, so we have Robert uh, who raised his hand. I guess we can. Uh, uh, is it Richard or? Okay. It's Richard. Yeah. Richard, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. hi. Uh, two questions. Um, I guess uh, I noticed that like uh, in your past two lectures, conditional neural processes have a connection to perhaps like multiple instance learning, which is uh, learning from like doing weekly supervised learning of, of instances in a bag. I was wondering, I guess, in reading attentive neural processes, it seems that the attention mechanism is applied within the layers. I was wondering if we could do something perhaps like a learn attention mechanism like at the aggregation step or if you tried that? Uh, yeah, so actually in attentive, uh, actually I don't know, remember whether the attentive neural process uses an attention layer, but actually in the set transformer paper, um, the aggregation is also uh, an attention as well. Yeah. And perhaps to ask a follow-up question, I think, uh, I think meta learning is I think has a lot of exciting implications in like a lot of other fields. Mm -hmm. um, like, um, I guess in reading, looking at also other literature I've seen, would contrastive predictive coding be a form of meta-learning that's like kind of also, that's also in the image space? Um, it's not clear that contrastive predictive coding is a meta-learning. It's uh, self-supervised learning and I think very exciting. Um, actually, the whole area of self-supervised learning is really cool in that, you know, you're, um, um, basically, you have some data like images, and you're form um, without necessarily knowing the labels. You can actually kind of basically produce your own labels that you can then train some using some supervised learning technique to distinguish between the true label and, and false labels. Uh, and then you, from there, you could kind of uh, use supervised learning techniques to get representations which turns out to work really, really well. So in a sense, the whole area around BERT is also about that. It's also about self-supervised learning. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that it's about, that it is meta-learning because, you know, you're, I guess I would think about meta-learning as um, you're actually meta, during the meta-learning phase, you're actually training your system to generalize well on a task that you care about during test time. So, and that's the training and the test conditions has to be the same. But in self-supervised learning, your initial training of the representation is different from how you actually evaluate the system. So in that, in that sense, it's not meta-learning, but it is a form of transfer learning, I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a, a question from Jonathan Scott. Uh, oh wait, there's one from Rinak as well. Perhaps I'm, perhaps I'm confused, but I thought in meta learning that we should, no, no, that's, that's the question that I already answered, sorry. And, uh, yeah, Jonathan Scott. Jonathan Scott. Yeah, so your description of equivariance and invariance sounds related generally to group theory, in particular represent representation theory of the symmetry group. Can one leverage the results from representation theory in this context? Um, Yes, probably. So there's a lot of work actually recently uh, that tries to bring in ideas from group and representation theory uh, to kind of explore, you know, how do you build in symmetries, symmetry properties, inductive biases into neural networks. And that's definitely an area that's very, very interesting. And it's quite a hot topic, I would say. Um, in our work, um, in the probabilistic symmetries one, we haven't really needed to use representation theory, but that could be something interesting, I think. Um, from Sashit Menon. Um, so, so, yeah, he's in the panel. Oh, yeah, so. I, I got oh, okay. it. Hi, so, hi, hi. I can just hi. ask it. Hi again. Um, first of all, sorry if this is a really basic question, but in the same graphical model that you just talked about a second ago, um, where we have F influencing both the whys from the train, the meta training set and the test set. Mm -hmm. um, in this setup, do you need these whys to like, 
So for different tasks itself, so do you need the different whys that you have to live in the same space? Like, do you need the tasks that you're doing to um, output things that are similar in that way? Or can you have different tasks that have outputs that live in different <laughs> spaces? Right, right, I see. Um, so you're asking whether different tasks could have different output spaces. Yeah. Um, I think it's possible. Um, yeah, I, I think it's possible. Um, but I guess you would end up with kind of, in a sense, different objectives or different tasks. But I think that's okay. You know, um, It's still sensible to try to optimize your shared parameters um, in such a way that you do well across all the tasks. Okay. And hope that um, you generalize to, to, to test tasks as well. I think that's definitely possible, yeah. Okay, um, um, and you kind of mentioned this, but what do you think of this of this kind of debate that's been going on over whether um, are we just learning features or are we actually learning better processes and should we be focusing on improving feature learning or on like these yeah, so, other types? Um, I think, you know, um, at the end of the day, um, so I feel that this might be one of those things where I think in deep learning, we see this quite a lot where um, you could have some fancy method and compared to some simpler method, but then, you know, but then with judicious choice of the right uh, architecture or inductive bias that you put in or and judicious choice of data sets, then uh, with a very big data set, then the simpler method often works better. <laughs> So, and this could be a, another case of, you know, well, you know, meta learning being the fancier method, but it, at the end of the day, you just need some representation learning method that kind of scales better in some way. It could be the case, I don't know. <laughs> Got it, thank you. So I, I should say that, you know, a lot of the best performing methods for in the, for like mini image net and tiered image net uh, examples, uh, kind of uh, data sets for meta learning. A lot of the best performing methods right now actually uses this combination where you can use uh, feature learning pre-training for uh, a REST net, and then you only meta learn the last bit of it. And that seems to work the best. So maybe some combination of the two. Like the almost no inner loop kind of. Uh, yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the, cool. yeah, so um, so I think the best performing ones are kind of, the last layer is more complicated. So you could use an SVM or you could, so in uh, as this work on a functional gradient descent, it's actually uh, multiple kind of attention modules. Mm -hmm. and that seems to work very well. Or actually multiple functional, kernel functional updates. Thank you. Is there another question? I have one. <laughs> okay, hi. Hi, Robert. Um, so you just spoke about kind of trying to, to minimize the inner loop by essentially yeah, doing a lot of outer loop training, right, in, in this case, like with mini image net and so on. And before that, you said that self-supervised learning was inherently different from meta learning, right? But as far as I know, when you like, um, most of self-supervised learning kind of constructs a form of task distribution by saying, okay, kind of resort um, different patches of an image or predict color and so on. And then also only does very little fine tuning on, on the final task, right? Mm -hmm. So could you maybe yeah. clarify again, the differences between self-supervised learning and meta learning? Um, I think it's what th this thing where I was trying to refer to, which is that there's this kind of a uh, basic, uh, assumption in meta learning which is that you want to train meta learn your meta train your system such that uh, it does as well as possible on the on test task okay and the way you do this is you is you set up your training scenario to be as close as possible to the test scenario so 
I would say that, you know, pro probably at least the current definition of a, a meta learning would be anything that has that sort of structure. Okay. And I think in that sense, uh, self-supervised learning like CPC doesn't have that structure because the initial learning of the representations is using this self-supervised signal that is different from how you might actually end up testing the system. So in that sense, it's different. Okay, good, thank you. But of course, they have similar sort of structure where you, uh, where you formulate a set of tasks in the set that you kind of train on. So in the case of self-supervised learning, you have lots of tasks uh, that you've kind of uh, constructed, right? In some okay. Thank you. Great. Um, so I have one question. Um, it's a, it's not that big. Um, so in neural processes or in conditional neural processes, uh, when you have some training points uh, as which, which you treat as context points, uh, then the approximated posterior, is it like unique or like I, I'm saying it in terms of the model is identifiable, which would always, given the certain context point would figure out the unique function approximation or? Um, so, so is the question whether the function is identifiable from the training yeah. set? Yeah, yeah. function identifiable. Um, I guess it's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the case that's identifiable, I think. But okay. I think it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a matter of the, how you set up the problem, right? I think. Um, if, the, if there's some aspect of the function that you can never see from your training data, mm -hmm. then it's not identifiable. But at the same time, if those bits of the function you don't ever need to use for prediction, then that non-identifiability maybe doesn't matter. Right, but if you, if you so the problem setting in, in neural processes is that you optimize for, a, for the certain task. But if you just wanna learn the representation of a function from just the context points only, um, right. then given this, uh, like within the approximation of this context point, it probably should be, uh, identifiable, but of course, I okay. I don't, I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, could be. I guess. Yeah. All right. Sure yeah. Answer this. It's, it feels to be. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. I think. Okay, no problem. Um, so I think we don't have any more questions. Yes. So we all we. We are all thankful to you for taking your time out and also going a bit over time. Okay. Um, so we have a- You don't have to go downstairs now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a round table with you tomorrow and I, I would assume all of the questions that people have, they will just pop up there. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks everybody for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.